So, uh, you know, I talked about the uh, the man machine interface in, in the Department of Defense for acquisitions. They call that uh, human factors engineering. And it's a key component that has to be planned into any requirement that you're writing uh, for uh, industry to try to, to fill for the government. And it kind of specs out uh, key points that they want uh, the system, whatever that system is, uh, to have to meet the, the largest amount of people people. So we've got a, a legacy weapon here, uh, the MP5 SD. Uh, I carried an SD uh, several times during my career for, for doing different stuff. And uh, it, it was absolutely phenomenal for sound suppression. It was just uh, extremely quiet. So if that was the most important thing, being extremely quiet, then, then the MP5 was essentially the tool that was in the toolbox for that. But it came at a really, really high cost. Uh, the uh, um, controls on this weapon system are radically different than that of the AR our platform so there was a there was a learning curve involved and there's a bunch of other things that you had to uh, you had to suffer through in order to get this sound suppression capability uh, starting at the rear you've got a two position uh, buttstock like the thing is extended or it's collapsed so uh, it lacked a good uh, length of pull adjustment to really be able to uh, size the weapon up to the uh, shooter when they were in armor uh, it has that more uh, aggressive to the rear uh, grip, which feels comfortable when you have it shouldered, but when you're carrying the gun for a long period of time, compressed up close to your body, really, really putting a lot of torque uh, on the wrist. And this was something that, that just kind of became more apparent to me as I got older and all my joints were, were tired uh, from you know a lifetime of just beating my body up. Um, the selector lever is uh, absolutely famous for being not, not very ergonomic. You've really got to, uh, unless you've got really big hands, you almost have to break the grip to get a solid purchase on the selector. And then if you're going down to take a quick shot, if you are too amped up, you'll go right past uh, semi and you could end up uh, letting a burst off. Uh, I actually had a set screw put in my uh, sub gun to where it could not go to auto. So I had made it a semi-auto only because I could not afford to be in a situation where I fired a burst of rounds when I thought I was firing a single round. Uh, it does not have a lockback capability after the last round. So you've got to manually come up and lock the gun open in order to be able to, uh, to uh, change mags and change a fresh round uh, and instead of a button style AR it has a, a rockaway magazine release system also this has an original HK three-point sling on it you did not have to use this sling but uh, you know these slings are very very popular uh, and kind of, they kind of peaked out in the uh, in the 90s um, when you're carrying a three-point sling you have an additional piece of fabric that ends up tracking across your gear and could be on top of kit or holding your magazines down so you're actually having to fight your sling to get additional magazines out of your fighting kit uh, to reload the weapon system. So uh, this is an example of uh, not the best ergonomics that we can do today. We can do better than this uh, for, for a, a fighting weapon. Here we've got a rifle. And it's just somebody's range rifle. It's it's no biggie. It's got a red dot sight, which is cool. Um, but it's missing other components to uh, a fighting uh, rifle. Even as a home defense weapon, it's lacking a flashlight. You have to be able to identify who you are engaging uh, when you're doing something as serious as uh, as applying deadly force. So I would consider a minimum on a rifle uh, to be a flashlight. I would take a weapon that had a flashlight and iron sights over one that had a red dot optic and nothing else. Uh, and then this one, uh, is kind of set up for your, uh, you know, cruiser carbine, home defense, uh, what have you. You've got your red dot optic. The argument could be made that a red dot, a red dot optic that times itself out like the EOTAC is not what you would want as a nightstand gun. 
Uh, the aim point is on and it's on all the time. Uh, so I consider the EOTech more of a work uh, optic and not, not a home defense optic, but um, you know, there's a lot of personal preference in there. And then you've got uh, a light and you have an interface to the light that allows you to activate it without having to move your hand placement. And that's kind of key. Um, there's no free lunch, and sometimes you're gonna have to, to make some sacrifices, but since there are no other enablers like lasers on this weapon system, uh, he can have it set up optimally to where uh, the activation switch is right there without any change to normal normal hand placement. Uh, two point sling system set up aft and on a sling swivel at the front of this, uh, this short rail that we've got going on here. And this system also has uh, a B5 Systems uh, grip, which has got um, that vertical design that I was talking about. Uh, they're ones made by Magpul, the K grips, they do the exact same thing, allow you to get the gun up and then have less of that wrist, uh, that wrist strain or that wrist break going on with the, uh, with the system. This shooter also has decided to uh, have a riser on their red dot, which is gonna give them that more heads up uh, shooting style. And then that brings us to our uh, duty setups here. So we've got a setup with a D-ball, setup with a mall, and a setup with a uh, L3 uh, PEC-15. And this is where we start talking about having to make decisions with the setup of our fighting rifle. Okay, you'll notice that none of the weapons that, that I've talked about have any type of backup sighting system. You wanna to try to have backup sights on your weapon if possible, preferably ones that can be accessed quickly without the need of any tools. If you've got backup iron sights at 12 o'clock mounted under a red dot sight that has been torqued, or excuse me, LPVO that's been torqued onto the gun, you're pretty much doing that so that the internet won't make fun of you. Uh, you couldn't actually in a fight if your LPVO was, was damaged, expect that you're gonna be able to remove uh, hex, uh, hex bolts and, uh, and access those irons. So you've got uh, offset iron sights that are, that are being provided now. It's just things to think about. A lot of people will say that they're gonna use their visible laser as their backup, and if they're indoors, that's probably, that's probably accurate. Outdoors and sunlight conditions like we have now, even green lasers are gonna be extremely hard to detect in, uh, in full sunlight. So you just need to uh, think through and have a plan uh, for those types of weapon setups. So um, this D-ball is uh, hooked to a double switch system from Surefire. Activate uh, one of the buttons, you're getting whatever setting your laser is on, you're activating the other one and you're getting your uh, mod light. So um, not, not, a bad, not a bad system set up here. And then on this pack, we've got the Aimpoint Pro. You see we do have a backup iron sight system on this fixed front sight post. And then you've got your PEC-15 at 12 o'clock, nice and happy, tucked up behind the front sight post like it was designed. Uh, a double switching system here, but notice how far back the double switching system had to go based upon the overall rail length. This person wanted a fixed front sight post and the sacrifice for that is shorter 12 o'clock rail space. So we have an activation button that's all the way back by uh, the barrel nut on this rifle. So that's a complete compromise of shooting grip. If we're, if you, all of your, uh, all of our sexy shoot them up fast recoil management uh, instructors are all out there teaching you to get your arm out as far forward on the rail as you can to manage the recoil of this weapon to shoot really, really fast splits. And then you set up your rifle that you're having to compress all the way back here. Your, your gun is basically mechanically set up counter to what your favorite uh, shoot them up fast instructor is telling you to do. So you've got to look at how am I going to interface uh, these items 
when I'm using my enablers uh, located in this location? And the answer might be that you have to move, move, your, move your, uh, your gadgets around. You might need to put the flashlight here and decide that you're gonna use the big mash button on top of the 15 and keep this as a backup altogether. So your primary engagement would be pressing the button here and if you need white light, rotating around and hitting a button somewhere in here. The other uh, thing that's going on with this setup is that this light is not down here, it's tucked up closer to the gun, and that is to try to slim down the overall uh, profile or signature on the rifle to be able to get it through portals and do things like that. But as we start getting into d the diameter of the light system, now we have to watch out for any type of splash of our uh, visual or IR laser hitting any of our enablers and then coming back and hitting us in the face, um, interrupting our ability to process information when we're actually in a fight. So when you set up something during the day, especially if it's gonna be a night vision compatible device, You've got to put nods on and you've got to dry fire your stuff uh, after, uh, after you have it all set up. Go in a closet, whatever, and see how much infrared signature is being projected back and creating photonic barriers uh, with your rifle setup. And you might have to move some stuff around to get a cleaner burn with, uh, with less dirty IR energy uh, impacting in and on your weapon system. And then, this system, um, LPVO and light and mall. So mall controls are obviously right here and here, and then the flashlight is located just behind it. Uh, this shooter, because they decided to use the smaller uh, Surefire end cap, the one that does not have a uh, clicky constant on, they've had to go with the Surefire button uh, or Surefire tape switch that has a constant on built into it. In the event that they need to turn on the light and leave it on for uh, backlighting or whatever, uh, or locking something down for an extended period of time uh, in the event they've got to take their hand off of their weapon, they don't lose uh, their white light. Um, this LPVO also has a uh, QD. So if this shooter wanted to, they could use a backup sighting system with a flip up front here, and then a flip up front somewhere down in here at 12 o'clock. And if their uh, optic was damaged, they could pop the throw levers and jettison the entire L uh, LPVO off their weapon, put up their flip up irons, and then uh, continue the fight. Uh, 45 degree offset irons do not work with the mall because they will not clear the housing of the laser. Uh, as I move forward, I am going to be uh, doing some uh, offset mini red dots to overcome this problem as well. They'll act as my backup iron sights and they'll be my primary engagement for passive uh, in the IR spectrum at night. So if I can't turn on my IR laser and I need to shoot, instead of trying to look through a low power variable optic with my nods down uh, and the LPVO back on one power, uh, which is less than optimal, it's much more difficult than doing that with a red dot sight, I'll have a mini red dot offset that I can use uh, under nods for that purpose. Uh, so, uh, this weapon does not have a sling. Uh, so I would say that uh, after a flashlight, a sling is the number one most important thing that you need to have on your rifle, and then a good uh, a good optic of some kind uh, coming in third. So that's just a quick rundown of a couple rifles. I didn't set any of these rifles up. These were all brought by various people on the range and uh, kind of my thoughts on them.